Uh, hello, my name is uh, Ida Jørgensen, and I'm from the uh, IT University of Copenhagen. And uh, what I will be talking about today is uh, Baudrillard's concept of uh, seduction in relation to digital games or, or gameplay, and how we can see instances of at least some specific, uh, some specific gameplay as, uh, as seducting, uh, seductive. I first want to make a disclaimer. What I'm talking about is single-player games. Uh, and or or the, the playable artifact in particular and if I sometimes say games or make claims about games in general I'm only talking about single-player games so um, I will begin by briefly introducing the concept of seduction um, and how we can think about uh, this concept in relation to gameplay then I will discuss a couple of examples of seduction in play and lastly hopefully if, if we have time I will offer some rather speculative re uh, reflections on what are the implications of uh, seduction in, in gameplay. Okay, so Baudrillard's uh, concept of seduction uh, has its roots in uh, his Marxist critique of consumer soci society and the fetishization of the consumer object. Uh, this critique refers to how the value of the consumer object no longer refers to its use value, but uh, to a symbolic exchange value. And Baudrillard understands this, uh, this void in uh, Saussurean terms as, uh, as a, a, a separation between signifier and signified. He also understands it as a historical process where to, in, in modern consumer society uh, the, signifier and the, signifi the signifier is completely cut off from the signified but still posing as a complete sign or as a, uh, as a, as a sign-like uh, structure. So this same reading eventually re results in the idea of the hyperreal, a somehow gloomy concept that is uh, typically read with a lot of negative connotations. However, it is not this concept uh, that I, uh, I will be addressing today, but instead the concept of seduction that I think is, of course, very much related to the hyperreal, but it's also a concept that has more uh, positive implication and, of course, hopefully will leave us with a bit of hope in the end. So, seduction operates in the same mode as the hyperreal, uh, but it also functions uh, as a subversive pra praxis a kind of uh, uh, mirror image to the hyperreal. And he actually doesn't call it the hyperreal until later, but the, the analysis is sort of the same also at this early stage. The, um, the concept of seduction also functions as a critique of uh, psychoanalysis and, of course, of hermeneutic interpretation that we have talked so much about these last days. So the argument is uh, that because of, uh, because of the separation between uh, signifier and signified, the sign now appears as, no more, uh, as nothing more than surface appearance. And any interpretive, interpretative strategies that seeks to uncover uh, something underneath, underneath this surface appearance, some Latin discourses, are essentially flawed. There is uh, thus no hidden truth, only surface expression. But instead of mourning the loss of, of truth, uh, the seductive celebrates and exposes it, uh, its own shallowness uh, and turns it into nonsense play. The seductive works exactly because of, uh, because of an obsession with nonsense and with the frill of the revelation of what we can call the burden or the yoke of interpretation and making meaning. So seduction reveals how empty signifier is already posing as, a, as signs, as something meaning, meaningful, using uh, different tactics, such as repeating something over and over again until it loses its supposed meaning, appearing so insignificant that we think we should not pay attention to it, uh, while it actually uh, makes us obsessed with this insignificant. Um, and then I have a couple of slides that I think I will just go over. I think maybe this slide is, uh, is important because Baudrillard says it's not what, this, uh, what seduction prohibits us from doing that makes us obsessed. It is nonsense in itself. So, so if, if the obsession with, was with the uh, prohibition, it would be so, sort of the classical psychoanalytical analysis. But instead, Baudrillard argues that it is, not, it is only the, the nonsense in, it, in itself. 
So I will now turn to our discussion of how gameplay can be seductive. But first, let me just uh, briefly uh, talk about how the player typically makes sense of the game. So when I talk, talk about meaning and making sense of the game, I'm not talking about some message uh, or statement that the game is trying to teach us. Instead, I'm talking about the trivial things that gamers do all the time when we, when we try to make sense of what the game wants us to do. So when the, the, um, the game is, uh, is meaningful, us, meaningful to us, we know what we should do in order to avoid uh, the game to come to an end. So when I'm talking about interpretation, I'm also talking about how the player can make sense of the game and learn what uh, she should do in order to play. So this is very much related to the gameplay condition and not related to all, all the other kind of things that may uh, affect our experience of play. Some games will be really nice and have uh, printed out instructions for us to read in advance, and then making sense of the game is rather easy. Other games will tr try to obscure it a bit more, and then it's, a, uh, of course, a matter of exactly interpretation. We can interpret things on a representational layer, for example, uh, the game world or NPCs or UI elements in the game may give us various hints about what we should do. But we can also interpret the game on a mechanical layer, and then we can sort of, by trial and error, think about what can I do, what can I not do in the game, what can the game do to me, and how can I enforce this or avoid this. So um, this kind of uh, interpretation is what uh, Oli Laino is calling reverse engineering. And th that is all about finding out how the game works and how the designer intends me as a player to overcome the resistance of the materiality of the game. So making sense of the game can thus rely on the knowledge of different conventions of play in some genres, and it can also be a result of interpretation of a sort of trial and error uh, play. So when I'm talking about seduction in games, I think it's crucial to stress that I, I'm not, uh, uh, I do not think that it's something that can be achieved uh, by the game alone. It's not only like an, a design attribute. Um, the game, as I will uh, show in a minute, can make various, uh, various uh, use various strategies to resist player interpretation, but it does not seduce if the player is not willing to be seduced. So this means if, that if we have a game that does not make sense, the player can still try to, to interpret it. And the result of this would be either that the player, at least in her own mind, would successfully say that I, have, uh, I can link uh, events in the game with my input, and then everything is, uh, is fine. And the other, other option would be that she is trying to do that and fails and then becomes so frustrated that she, uh, she uh, closed down the game. The third option would, of course, be that she lets herself be seduced by the game. OK, so in the following, I will now uh, try to find some examples of seductive gameplay. So this is instances of play where the materiality of the game somewhere or the other resists the, the player's project of interpretation uh, and meaning making and instead celebrates the shallowness of the game. So I will give you a few examples, but they're only meant as examples, so I don't mean that these are different uh, categories or any exhaustive list. Um, but only examples where I have found games that somehow resist player interpretation. It is also important to, to point out, I think, that, that uh, the games that I will be talking about is games that is designed deliberately to confuse the player, but for me it's not important if, if, the, if the game has been designed as such, but only the effect that it has on the player. So we can also imagine meaninglessness in, a, in the encounter with a bug, for example, or we can also in, uh, think of meaninglessness as a, 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 a result of the player really being a poor player, which I think is often the case when I play games at least. So I uh, encounter meaninglessness in games a lot. Um, yeah. So, so furthermore, I want to stress that I do not, uh, in, I do not mean that, that these strategies make the game as whole uh, meaningless. Uh, they are more meant as instances of gameplay where the, this player's project of interpretation is resisted.
So the first example I will give relates to the re representational layer of the game. As mentioned, the player may interpret different representations and thus realize what she's supposed to do. But this can be very difficult if the, play, if the game is filled with uh, representational objects that somewhere the other deceives the player. Actually, I think this happens a lot in games. Uh, it could, examples could be when pure representations pose as game elements, for example, a door that we think we can open, but then it turns out just to be a decorational element. Luckily, these instances are quite um, easy to overcome because when we realize that the, the door cannot open, then we, the problem is uh, we just think, okay, so I, I'm going to try another strategy. Um, but here we have examples where where I think the game has been designed on a representational layer to, to uh, deliberately confuse, confuse, um, confuse the player. The, the, I have highlighted two games. Uh, the picture on the left is from the game uh, I Don't Even Game, a simple puzzle side-scrolling game where an NPC warns the player that if she walks further, she will lose all pro uh, progress in the game. Unfortunately, the player ha has no option to move further because she can actually only do one thing at this stage of the game that is move to the right. So she can only observe this warning and then still move to the right. The other alternative would be simply to stop playing. Luckily, this also turns out not to be, the, to be true. So actually the player has not lost any progress but is actually progressing the game just fine. The other example is from the game Frog Fractions, where uh, uh, it's from a long sequence where the frog travels, as you can see, on top of a dragon in space. And this space is filled with meteors, and the player is via a dialogue bo uh, box in the corner over and over again warned that, uh, uh, about the meteors and all the terrible things that will happen if the player is hit by one of them. The player is also informed of the great dissatisfaction with the performance if she does not avoid the meteors. But actually, the meteors, uh, any encounter with them will have absolutely no impact on the game. And the, and the player will progress the game either way. Nothing happens. In this whole sequence, the player can actually instead just leave the keyboard, go for a cup of coffee, and wait until the frog will inevitably uh, reach the next, uh, the next stage of the game. So the next example refers more on the, to the mechanical level, level of the game. Um, here I'm, I'm uh, thinking about inconsistent mechanics, how the, the mechanics can be very so inconsistent that it makes uh, interpreting uh, what to do and what uh, the player is able to do and when very difficult. Um, again, in I Don't Even Game, the player can have uh, only one consistent ability in the game, and that is uh, that uh, she can move to the right. But during the game, she also learns that she has other abilities as well. For example, pressing the Q key on the keyboard will, uh, will enable, her, enable her to drop things. However, this does not work many times. She can, be, uh, she can have a lot of things during the game, which she, of course, never takes voluntarily. That is sort of just imposed on her. But when she has objects, she can sometimes press the Q key and the objects will drop to the ground. But other times, she cannot do that and she can just hold the objects. So the, it, it's impossible for the player to know, to see any kind of uh, consistent structure in her uh, abilities in the game. Another example would be uh, this is the only level, another game, where uh, the player is playing the same level over and over and over again, but the mechanics change each time. So what the player has to do is to reach from the portal on the right to, uh, on the left to the portal on the right, and sometimes, and sometimes not, she will also have to press some key to open uh, the door. Uh, the mechanics and uh, of the game changes every time and sometimes she will have to do less and sometimes she will have to do even more and in this example we also have uh, this idea that, that Baudrillard himself poses about re repeating something until it becomes meaningless. So the third strategy would be a strategy of intertextuality and when I'm talking about intertextuality here I'm ref referring to it as a stylistic device where a work of art can refer to another work of art um, in itself. 
So um, intertextual uh, references are very significant in the game Frog Fractions because actually the game is one big parody of other games. But in, in that case, the intertextuality does not do anything to our uh, ability to, to play the game. That's just sort of an extra thing, an external thing. Uh, but in the, exam in the example of I don't even game, the intertextual devices are used in a way that makes it impossible to, for the player to progress the game if she does not know these references or that if, if she refuses to leave the game and try to find out what it's all about. There are two examples. Um, well, in one of them, the player is, is uh, asked that, that uh, she needs to input a, a 30 lives code if she want to progress the game, and that's sort of it. And the player may be so lucky that she knows what a 30 live code is, uh, and she, she knows it from, from, from many Nintendo games, for example. And if she's even more lucky, she also remembers the, game, the, the code, and she can just input it. But if she doesn't know what a 30 live code is, or if she doesn't remember the combination, she has to, uh, she has to, to leave the game, <laughs> leave, the, leave play, and, uh, and perform, for example, a Google search, or ask somebody, uh, somebody uh, for the code. Another example that's even more difficult is that in the end of the game, the player will encounter this obstacle and will need to input a, a code that is found on uh, following this URL. Uh, this is a, another game, a mini game that, that is located on a completely separate server. And unfortunately, at this stage, the server is all, also taken down. So now the player has no ability to actually play the mini game and uh, obtain the code. Luckily, she can also, of course, find the code uh, posted in uh, many uh, online threads, uh, etc. So, so we, can, we can get the code, we can progress the game, but only if we sort of leave play. There is no, nothing in the game world in itself that hints us, uh, to, uh, hints us or gives us any ability to solve, to solve this puzzle. So, the last example would be uh, insignificant actions. So, let's see here. Yeah. In this last example, uh, uh, I'm using uh, frog fractions uh, as an example again. Um, I think also the other game, I don't even game, could have been used just as well. But now I'm using frog fractions. And uh, insignificance refers to how the actions of the, uh, whether the actions of the player matter at all or uh, how much they matter. For example, if you die in frog fractions in some stages of the game, you will see a gray, like the, the game is grayed out, but you don't lose any points, you don't lose any progress, nothing at all, and after a second you can just continue playing. So death in frog fractions means nothing at all. The other example is, is later in the game where you will have to, to, uh, to, um, to, to uh, answer some questions by a judge in order to progress, but actually whether you choose like either of the four five options you choose, you will progress. So the only thing that matters here is just pressing any key. So that is, uh, that is the strategy of insignificant actions. So the idea of this is, of course, that it's, it becomes impossible for the player to see when an action matters and when an action does not matter. When is it important what I do and when could I just as well be watching a movie while playing? So. Um, The question is, of course, now, what uh, this means. So to Baudrillard, the, the seductive works as this uh, mirror image that reveals to us that truth is only a principle. So what does that mean in relation to games? So following Baudrillard's reading, we can say that seductive play here reveals a basic meaninglessness in all playable artifacts. The playable artifact works as what Baudrillard calls cold seduction or the ludic. In cold seduction, the player encounters the game as a, detective, as a detective searching for a state of optimal functioning of the game. This is, of course, similar to the idea of a reverse engineer. In cold, seduc in cold seduction, therefore, nothing is uh, at stake. So this might seem paradoxically, since the play playable artifacts described by, by Leno actually gives the player both freedom and resistance to this freedom. Compared to this, the games that I have uh, just described, actions are highly limited, and many of them would not even have any impact on the game at all. However, 
In the playable artifacts, everything is regulated by the law, which is a descriptive rules that sort of governs the, governs the play. Um, and that is, of course, to, to Baudrillard, not uh, real laws. It is not the truth. It is only an uh, explanatory principle by which we understand, uh, which we are able to interpret uh, events in the game as cause and effect. In seductive games, the law keeps the player from doing anything at all. The law becomes so totalizing that it becomes meaningless to play. Um, and it is not the, what the player cannot do in this game uh, that's a problem, uh, that seduces or, or obsesses us, us. It's instead the pure meaninglessness in itself. So faced with these instances of meaningless play, uh, either as designed objects or uh, as, uh, as box, um, for example, uh, yeah, that doesn't matter. We can no longer understand the game as a playable artifact that grants us freedom, but also resists this freedom. Instead, it is revealed to us that the descriptive rules that governs our play is nothing more than this explanatory principle, a way of structuring uh, events in the game as, cause of, uh, as causes and effect. And, uh, and uh, in the meaninglessness of play, this structure by which we make sense of the game becomes impossible and breaks down in nonsense. We are thus left with no other option than to perceive the game not as a playable artifact anymore, but as an entity of uncertainty. Our illusory attitude to the game thus changes from being uh, the attitude of the detective or the reverse engineer, but emerges as a leap of faith or a pact uh, with the game. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions in the audience? Thank you very much. I want to ask, sorry if it's a stupid question, but you said this only applies to single player games, yes. so why? Uh, because uh, I think for, for, for Baudrillard at least, well, he's talking, about, he's talking about computer games in general, but the example he, he gives is single-player games. So, so I think for Baudrillard, and also for me, it does not make sense to talk about it in relation to multiplayer games or, or non-digital games, or at least games where it is, the rules is not imposed on us by the materiality of the game, but it's a sort of a social negotiation, because we cannot be seduced by that. That is sort of a, that's already a pact that we have been, we are engaged in with the other players. Are there other questions? Hi, thank you. Very interesting. First time I hear Baudrillard in this context. Um, in Seduction, Baudrillard also talks about seduction as a form of reflection, right? He starts talking about it from the, uh, starting from the myth of Narcissus. Or Narcissus. Yes. Do you see also that aspect of seduction applying to video games? So self-reflexivity, like it's sending back an image of ourselves and we love it so much that we are addicted or attracted to it? Well, yes, I suppose. I I've, 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 I've have not been thinking about that because in my, in my head it's been very much related to, to, to the, 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 the materiality of the game and, and this idea of a, of a playable artifact and so on and so on. But, Yes, I suppose so. I, I haven't given it much thought, though. But, but uh, I'm sure it applies. But I think this would be interpretation or meaninglessness on a, or lack of interpretation on another level than what I'm talking about. That is sort of very much directly related to our actions within the game. So thank you, Ida. <laughs>